I too feel something of an imposter here, since um, quite apart from anything else, I, I'm not a representative of this university, but of a rival university elsewhere in the Midlands, the University of Birmingham, uh, where I will be organizing a one-day event about Shakespeare and China for the university's China Institute in 2016. Uh, that great anniversary year for uh, Shakespeare, the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. One of the things which will be happening in 2016, uh, as was announced just yesterday, will be that the Royal Shakespeare Company will preside over the first of their um, productions of Shakespeare produced in Mandarin in China. Uh, they inaugurated two years ago a project to translate all of Shakespeare's works into uh, a Mandarin better adapted for use in rehearsal rooms and for use in stage productions uh, than existing translations. I do um, have a background in Oxford in that I came here as an undergraduate and a postgraduate. Uh, and two of the abiding friendships I made as an undergraduate uh, were one with a young woman called Li Lan Yong, who is now the head of the uh, Asian Shakespeare Intercultural Archive uh, in Singapore, with whom I'm developing a distance learning course about uh, Shakespeare in current <coughs> Asian performance. Uh, and the other was with a young man called Sebastian Wood, now Sir Sebastian Wood, who until earlier this year was British ambassador to China, uh, and whose father was an actor with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and who was, I think, very much involved in getting a great deal of government funding for the RSC to translate uh, Shakespeare and you into Mandarin. Um, I can claim, however, to have beaten Sebastian to Beijing, since I went over there and worked as a, a visiting fellow at, at Peking University uh, in 1999. Now, one of the things that strikes me about China's recent arrival, uh, or renewal of its presence in the international world of Shakespearean scholarship and performance, is that there are both symmetries and asymmetries with the way in which China arrived in the Shakespearean theater um, in the first place, uh, way back in 1604, uh, that period when uh, even the Bodleian was unable to read Mandarin characters. Uh, and if I can make this thing work, we might get another picture. Let's try that. Does that do anything? Um, oh, there we go. Look, 1692 Here we go. Uh, in 1604, in Hampton Court, the same Christmas season in which James I saw Midsummer Night's Dream, the previous night they had an entertainment that involved, according to the rebels' accounts, flying Chinese magicians. Now, these of course weren't genuinely Chinese people, and I doubt very much whether they were genuinely magicians. Uh, they were exotic, um, exotically dressed people being whirled around on strings. Uh, and you'll see possibly what they may have looked like from this illustration. As far as I know, this is the earliest visual record we have of anybody appearing in show business in Britain as a Chinese character. As you see, it's from a dance of antics, also known as a dance of phantasms, uh, in a mask performed at court in 1617 called Vision of Delight. Uh, with a script by Ben Johnson. Johnson does not say, I'm a dramatist, and I've heard there are really interesting dramatists in China, and I've learned this from them, and I'm putting this on stage. All he is able to do is produce a dancer with a pigtail, uh, and that alone is supposed to signify a sort of general Chineseness. Um, it was a much more cosmopolitan occasion in terms of its audience than in terms of its content, uh, since one of the people watching this show uh, was Princess po Pocahontas uh, over from Virginia. Now, Midsummer Night's Dream goes out of fashion in the later 17th century. Uh, it's now one of Shakespeare's most popular plays. Indeed, it's the most popular play by anybody in France, uh, which is you know, a weirdly striking uh, piece of trivia for you. But um, 
in the late 17th century, as theatres became more spectacular, more Baroque, uh, Shakespeare's drama, which relies so heavily on spoken poetry, uh, was in trouble. Uh, and this is a marked up script of Midsummer Night's Dream from about 1670, in which, as you can see, the theatre managers have marked up great long passages of the script as being completely unnecessary and needing to be cut. And in fact, it appears that in the end they decided they wouldn't bother reviving the play at all. The solution turned out to be this. Uh, in 1692, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream was converted into a semi-opera, a massively spectacular musical with enormous visual effects, and to help out all the Shakespearean dialogue which was being cut, it has a grand climax which sets Shakespeare's play, uh, or transports Shakespeare's play about Theseus and Hippolyta in a wood near Athens, uh, to somewhere much more interesting in 1692, namely China. Uh, in a grand finale, the fairies turn up in Theseus's court and say, look, we're, we're, we're going to prove that fairies exist by staging um, a great show about China. And as you see, the scene is suddenly illuminated and discovers a transparent prospect of a Chinese garden. The architecture, the trees, the plants, the fruit, the birds, the beasts, quite different from what we have in this part of the world. Uh, and this enormous piece of stage chinoiserie is uh, laid on for us, uh, and Chinese characters come on and start singing about how happy they are and how eternally peaceful their civilization is. Uh, and uh, yes, it, it continues. Uh, you know, she's called Zanshi, uh, and uh, they have uh, lovely duets. If any of you know the music to this show, which is by Henry Purcell, uh, you'll, you'll know that the music that is set for this scene uh, provides plenty of evidence that Henry Purcell had never heard any Chinese music in his life. It's pure orthodox European Baroque music. Um, but the visuals uh, are all about showing off Chinese silks, showing off Chinese ceramics. In fact, as so often, this has much more to do with internal politics than with international politics since it was designed as a compliment to the then monarchs, William and Mary, who had a huge collection of Chinese porcelain at Hampton Court. And um, the, uh, as you'll see, one of the things they show off as being inten in intensely Chinese is orange trees. And of course, the king was called William of Orange. So you know, Chinese oranges, you, know, you can't lose putting Chinese oranges on stage uh, in a show aimed at William and Mary. So there's a generalized sense of China as somewhere that is close to Arcadia, somewhere that specializes in the immemorial arts of peace, uh, craft traditions that aren't about individual artistic breakthroughs. Uh, and in fact, here's an example of how um, the sort of discovery of Chinese art uh, is assimilated to the Western tradition. This is Charlottenburg Palace in Berlin. Uh, near to which Sebastian is at the moment now. He's, now he's been sent to, to Berlin instead. Um, where the room in which the German royals were displaying all their china has a ceiling depicting the classical mythology of Aurora. Uh, it's, the, it's a sort of ancient Roman dawn to show that we're in the East, but essentially um, all this Chinese stuff is simply being put on the usual old mythological map. China is just, for the moment, a generalized annex uh, of Arcadia. Now, things change, obviously, over the intervening period. Here we are in the present day, and of course, uh, you can tell that's Beijing by the color of the sky. Um, if in 1692, one improved Shakespeare's uh, Western drama by putting in a Chinese song and dance number, uh, in the modern Chinese theatre, we've instead seen uh, productions of Shakespeare enhanced by incorporating a sort of westernizing uh, musical elements. Um, I first went to Beijing in 1999, this is Peking University, 
when I was first at Peking University, it was still very much recognizable as the university that William Empson had fled to, came from, to, uh, fled to from Cambridge in the 1930s. It's been hugely uh, rebuilt over the last 15 years. It's expanded massively, uh, has very, very marvelous facilities, one of which is the Centennial Auditorium, uh, a very large theater building uh, in which there are now very large uh, theater productions. Uh, when I was there, there were posters up for three different Shakespeare productions that were coming to the campus, including this one, uh, Lin uh, Richard III, uh, which came to London in 2012 and again earlier this year. Uh, it's one of a trilogy of Shakespeare plays directed by uh, Lin for the Beijing People's Arts Theatre, all of them excitingly controversial plays. Richard III, a play about a tyrant, a play about politics as usual, a play, play about how you obtain the appearance of popular assent and abuse the legal system to stay in power. Uh, Hamlet, a play about a solitary dissident uh, against uh, a corrupt and illegitimate autocracy. And um, the last of the three he produced Coriolanus, uh, a play which in its first scene depicts a military leader who wants to set the army uh, on demonstrators in the streets and, and kill them. You know, these are potentially uh, very uh, charged issues uh, for any theatre company. What's striking, I think, about what uh, Lin Jiahu does with them is that in ways that are like and unlike what happened to Midsummer Night's Dream all those years ago, he not only naturalizes Shakespeare by producing this sort of imperial period ancient Rome done in the style of um, China, but he also introduces uh, a very um, vernacular Western style musical element in that the battle scenes are scored by two Beijing heavy metal bands, one of them called Miserable Faith and the other one called Suffocated. Um, and whereas in 1692, Purcell was completely unable to produce Chinese music, uh, in 2013, um, Miserable Faith and Suffocated are actually pretty good at heavy metal. Uh, this is an international Western style uh, which Chinese performers have very much been able to take over and adopt and use uh, for local purposes. Uh, so the inverse, you know, the Shakespeare has been very much adopted into the Chinese theatre as part of what, uh, what's been perceived as a Western modernity over the last century. Um, I think Shakespeare is less and less perceived as English outside the Anglophone world, more and more a kind of lingua franca for all of world drama. But I think what's striking is that while Shakespeare can be adapted in China in highly nuanced local ways, uh, in England, when Chinese drama is performed, it is still perceived as generically traditional and Chinese. What we see in the way of the Chinese performing arts in this country tends to be uh, Beijing opera troupes who are perceived as just being vaguely traditional rather than about something in particular. And I think it's the most optimistic aspect of the Royal Shakespeare Company project that as well as um, patronizing and helping with a translation of Shakespeare into modern Mandarin, and providing assistance and suggestions about how Chinese actors may want to perform, uh, which is what's happening in Shanghai uh, this autumn when the first of these translations happens. They are also choosing classical Chinese plays to adapt into English and to perform in this country, to try to produce some beginnings of a corresponding visibility uh, for the Chinese heritage of theater uh, on the English stage uh, at the same time as Shakespeare continues to be uh, a common language uh, for the negotiation of theatrical culture uh, right around the world. Thank you.
Professor Dobson, thank you very much indeed. Yet another example of interpenetrating cultures. We'll come back to that in the panel discussion. It's a pleasure now to introduce Mr. Chi Ming Chu, Executive President of the Sung Chi Ling Foundation. Mr. Chi.